Um, we have a terrific panel here tonight to address what is, in fact, the central issue uh, before the country this year. What does it take uh, to succeed as president? Um, and I guess I will paraphrase John F. Kennedy, that not since Thomas Jefferson dined alone has there been so much <laughs> understanding and wisdom about the White House in one place. Um, George Mitchell, the former Senate Majority Leader, served under Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, and served as a special envoy for President Obama. Andrea Mitchell of NBC has covered every president since Jimmy Carter. David Gergen of the John F. Kennedy School of Government served in the White House under Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and Bill Clinton. Joe Klein of Time Magazine has covered every president since Carter and is now covering his 10th presidential campaign. Mike Cranish of the Boston Globe, <laughs> biographer of Mitt Romney uh, in a new book. Uh, like me, is kind of the junior member of the panel having covered every presidential campaign and president since 1984. <laughs> um, I, it's sort of like, uh, I, was, I was thinking as I was saying that of the, of the recent interview with Bruce Springsteen where he described Nils Lofgren as the new guy in the band because he's only been there since 1984. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of experience here and Senator Mitchell, let me start with you. You have served uh, under and for uh, a number of presidents, including this one. Let's talk about the personal qualities that, that Barack Obama has brought to this job. In terms of his emotional, emotional uh, makeup, his strategic sense, his tactical sense, what are the biggest strengths and weaknesses that you have seen in his leadership style? Uh, and are, is there any president that he reminds you most of in the way he has approached the job? Well, first, uh, as a member of the Senate, I served under and for, as you described, and I also served with. Uh -huh. Good for you. Don't forget that. Yeah, huh? yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. I know Clinton couldn't Members forget the that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ind independently elected. <laughs> yes. And, uh, uh, and, and remind us of that. All right, so right. having said that. Yeah. It's given me a few minutes to think about yeah, the answer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to say I'm not objective. Uh, while I, I know Mitt Romney quite well, he and I served on a corporate board together, and I regard him as a friend. Uh, I uh, strongly support uh, President Obama's reelection, so I don't. These folks all mm -hmm. pretend to objectivity. <laughs> not very I hard. Do not. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to be as objective as I can in my remarks, but everybody should understand the context. Uh, I think he is uh, uh, one of the most intelligent persons I've met, uh, not just in, in comparison to other presidents, but in or out of politics and anywhere in my life. And I've been involved in a lot of different activities. I think he's uh, well organized. Uh, uh, I think he has a, uh, what I admire as a, a, a careful and calculated approach to considering issues and making decisions with respect to them. Uh, he is a human being and therefore uh, has weaknesses and faults as we all do. Going to be a little careful about identifying the faults mm -hmm. because no offense to the press, sometimes half of what you say gets published and the other half doesn't. Uh, Why are uh, you pointing it out? I, I, let's put it this way: everybody learns on every job, and presidents more so than any other job. Uh, and so I think he has learned a lot uh, in the past three and a half years. Among the lessons I think he's learned, or at least now I'm hoping he's learned, is that in a negotiation, uh, whether it's with Congress or with a foreign leader or anyone else, intelligence, reason, and flexibility are very good qualities to possess. But if you are the only party in the negotiation who possesses those qualities, <laughs> then, then, then they operate to your disadvantage. Andrew? Yeah. 
Is that the end of my answer? I think that's the end. Are you ready to see the I floor, earlier, Senator? I mentioned earlier that I served yes, in the I Senate. Yes, I said that, right. <laughs> you mentioned yes, um, we, As you have watched him, what has surprised you most about the way he's approached the presidency relative to what you saw as a candidate and a senator? Let me just first say that your answer, Senator, uh, explains fully why President Clinton tried to persuade you to accept the nomination for the Supreme Court. Judicious, considered, <laughs> but very, very smart. If I could interject, I, I've often been asked do I regret it that I didn't accept his nomination and only three times. Bush versus Gore, Citizens United. I thought it was going to be three times, <laughs> only two times. <laughs> I think what surprises me most is that someone as intelligent and principled and experienced as Barack Obama from the way he ran as a candidate and from his experience as a senator has not reached out more to Congress and has not reached out more to diverse elements of even the Democratic Party. Um, it, that to me has been surprising and um, I just think that the mark of success um, almost demands being more of an external figure. It just seems as though there is an insulation in the White House that is almost reminiscent of Jimmy Carter. And I know that that, that will surprise people because they are such <coughs> different characters. But there's also a, 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 a reserve for a, a man who is a great retail politician, but not as great as the greatest, Bill Clinton, uh, but who clearly knows how to work a crowd and, and <coughs> you know, connect to people. I think in, a, in the Richmond debate that Bill Clinton won and dominated with George Herbert Walker Bush by crossing over and reaching out to that. She's checking yeah, your watch. checking your watch. Sorry. Um, <laughs> by reaching out to that woman who was concerned about her unemployment, that Barack Obama would have that same response, the human response. There's that connection. I just think that, uh, just in observing, that he could have been so far, much more successful if he brought more people into the circle and if he used his cabinet or some members of the cabinet um, more effectively. Can you, you teach leadership? Talk about the ledger sheet and his qualities as a leader. What, what does he do well? What are the biggest uh, demerits? <clears throat> uh, well, thanks. Uh, let me put my cards on the table first. I, I voted for Barack Obama uh, through, uh, in his first election. I have not yet decided how I will vote in this election. I'm actually torn in a lot of ways, um, which reflects, I think, to some degree, the uh, way a lot of Americans have responded uh, to his leadership. The, in my judgment, he actually has been a, a, a better than expected foreign policy president. Uh, I think he's actually handled Iran, Iran, for we were on an earlier conversation about Iran. Mm -hmm. I think he's handled it very well. Uh, I think it's been prudent and he has been tough uh, he's been much tougher minded than I expected in foreign policy. He's been willing to use force uh, in a very, very nuanced and thoughtful and limited way. Uh, he reminds me to some degree, and a very, very different kind of president, but he reminds me to some degree of the approach that Dwight Eisenhower took when he was in office. Try not to commit troops on the land wherever you can, but use whatever other uh, alternatives you have at your disposal to protect Americans' interests. And I, you know, I think there's some exceptions and we can disagree about some other elements. And I've tried to figure out why is he so much better at foreign policy as a leader than he is at domestic policy. And uh, I think to some degree that is because uh, the, the people around him do not uh, weigh every decision based on politics. That the, the, he has a group of professionals around him and I think that they think seriously about what's in the best interest and how to do it. 
and I think he's got, I think he's got a good team around him. And you know, mm -hmm. keeping Bob Gates was mm -hmm. I thought a first class decision. I thought I think Hillary's worked out well. Um, having put, moving Petraeus into the CIA, I thought he ought to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, but I thought that was a good move. I think Donlin has done a better job than I expected. You know, I, yeah. Tom is a friend of mine, and I think he's really risen to this. Uh, you know, so I've been on the on the foreign policy front. I, I think that he deserves higher marks than he is often given. I think he's been much less effective as leader on the domestic side, and I can't quite figure out why. I think Andrea has put her finger on a number of the elements of the reserve. Um, uh, but I also and and something I so emphatically agree with. He has some terrific people around him for whom I have enormous respect, but he would be well served as, as Reagan did when Reagan came in. He brought his Californians with him and they continued to be very close in, but he also hired a man who had been chief of, who had run two campaigns against, against him. The day after he got elected, he hired Jim Baker as his chief of staff. And that really changed the equation inside. He was a much more effective president, I think, as a result of that. So uh, there is, I, I do think that somehow rhetorically, uh, he's, he's, you know, they, they, he did, to go back to the old Cuomo phrase, he did campaign in poetry, but he's governed in prose, and somehow I, I, I think that has not stirred the nation's soul the way, it, the way it might. But at some point, to lead, you have to be out front. You cannot do this so in, in the presidency from the side, from behind, by corralling people, shepherding people along. You've got to be out front, I like Simpson Bowles, mm -hmm. and I believe in trying to tell us what he's going to do in the second term before he gets elected. And, and Joe, and that has been one of the characters, especially on the domestic mm -hmm. side. The idea, you know, the phrase leading from behind was applied to foreign policy, uh, you know, the quote, but in domestic policy as well, in the Congress, he has given, it when the Democrats <coughs> had the majority, enormous deference to the Democratic leaders to shape he has often wanted to allow a consensus to develop before he kind of puts his cards on the table, puts all his chips down. Is that too passive an approach in the presidency or has it served him well at times? Let me, can I make a, a global yeah. uh, cosmic statement about the qualities that define a great president? I keep on learning new ones with each president. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, with Jimmy Carter, I learned that a, an essential quality is that you gotta respect the town. You gotta respect Washington and deal with it. With Ronald Reagan, I learned that you got to respect the details. Um, you couldn't just let the staff do it for you. Uh, with George H.W. Bush, I learned that you had to have a vision. With Bill Clinton, I learned that you had to have dip discipline. Um, <laughs> with, with George W. Bush, I learned that you had to have an intellectual curiosity um, that involved inconvenient thoughts for yourself. Um, and, and with Barack Obama, I've learned that you gotta love the game. And, um, and it's something that, I mean, the guy has been a mystery to me in many ways. Some of the things that you, I, I agree with David completely about uh, his foreign policy. Uh, he's been an excellent, excellent commander in chief and foreign policy president. Um, but I never met a politician before who gives people money and doesn't tell them about it. I mean, you know, I was, I was at a town meeting in Yuba City, California a couple of years ago. Guy gets up and says, my mom's in assisted living. She likes to keep her own checkbook. But last week she got $250 in, uh, in her direct de deposit account. She didn't know where it came from. And I looked it up and it came from the federal government. It was filling the donut hole. And he couldn't tell them that? He couldn't show up at some elderly couple's house. He's certainly got a lot saved up in the dignity bank. He couldn't show up at a, he, he couldn't show up at some elderly couple's house with a giant publisher's clearinghouse check for two hundred and fifty dollars and a bag of donuts. I mean, in all of the other aspects, in terms of you know my enlightened self-interest, I'm I'm not ashamed to admit it. My enlightened self-interest is that I want to have politicians who are willing to think creatively in my presence rather than just give me talking points. And he passes that text, test with flying colors. And in fact, Mitt Romney passed it, that test with flying colors when he was doing universal health care in Massachusetts, <laughs> which he won't talk yeah. about anymore. But, um, but there is a sense that he has that I've gotten from him that he finds the hugger mugger, the, you know, the gritty, dirty, dealing of politics mm -hmm. somehow demeaning mm -hmm. and something that 
he wants to rise above. And if you don't love the game, <laughs> it's going to hurt you. Yes, Clinton loved the game. Yeah. FDR yeah. loved the game. Yeah. So, Mike, we, we, you know, one of the, one of the uh, occasional theories about politics is that we elect presidents. Each president we elect is to uh, fill the hole that we saw in the previous one, right? So, like, Bush was kinder and gentler than Reagan, and Clinton was more engaged in domestic policy than Bush, and then Bush was more morally disciplined than uh, Clinton, and then Obama was smarter and more curious than, than Bush. You've written, you've written a lot about Mitt Romney. T talk about how you think he, his conception of the presidency and what the role of the president is and his approach to the presidency might differ from, from what we've seen under Obama. Well, one of the core beliefs of Mitt Romney is this business belief. He believes in this theory of creative destruction in business and bringing a business discipline to the White House. Um, certainly, you can look back at the list of presidents in our history. There's not that many business people who've been presidents. And then you can ask the question, those people who were business people, did that make them a better president? So he is putting that front and center in his campaign, saying, this is what qualifies me. Um, yes, he's talked about Bain Capital, his 15 years of experience there, less so about his governorship, because it involves health care, and it involves a lot of things that he did with the Democratic legislature. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of things, and I covered uh, Senator Mitchell's uh, Senate majority leadership for a couple of years, and I was thinking about that as we were talking, because uh, Senator Mitchell was pilloried by the Wall Street Journal, a lot of other places about what he wanted to do, and then George H.W. Bush was pilloried for what he wanted to do, and somehow those two sides did come together. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, mm -hmm. George H.W. Bush lost his reelection. So some people say, well, that means he was a failure because he didn't win again. Um, but some other people would say, wait a second, he took some risks working with people like Senator Mitchell. He did the Clean Air Act, the Americans with Disabilities right. Act, the budget deal, and on and on. And now Cap the story and trade. Is, sorry? Cap and, and trade. trade. <laughs> and the Clean Air Act is, is really uh, Senator Mitchell's one of his capstone achievements, no pun intended. Th that's something he did you know, with, uh, George, uh, with President George H.W. Bush, and it really um, is something that now Republicans reject, you know, for the most part. They didn't want cap and trade, and that's sort of the analog to health care, because this was something that, I don't want to speak for Senator Mitchell, but it was portrayed as, we're embracing one of your Republican ideas. And that is how, as I recall it, he brought on support from the other party. Some of his own party weren't so crazy about that, and now we sort of see the same thing uh, with health care. Uh, so, go ahead. So let me, so let me ask this. Is, is there anyone, on the, any, the rest of the panel, as Mike noted, Romney is emphasizing his business background much more than his experience as governor as a selling point for president. Thoughts on the relevance of that business experience to doing this job, David? I think it's highly relevant. I think it's highly relevant to how you make decisions. Uh, you know, which and, and I think you have to look at him and I think the way he has typically you know, brought in evidence and weighed carefully and thought through. That's the reason he was highly successful in this business. You need to do that in the White House. I think it goes to this judgment point you were making about George W. Uh, and uh, I, I do think it also brings a worldview about how the world works. I, I, I'm frankly drawn to, more drawn to his worldview about how you've got economic growth than I am the Obama worldview. My concern about, or I'm going to come back to you on it, is to what degree he's going to be a hostage to the Tea Party. And, you know, I, from my point of view, a second Romney term would probably be a pretty darn good term. But in the first term, he's going to be running for re-election. Uh, and you know, so the question becomes, can he govern independently as who he is, or is he going to continue to pander? Go ahead, Andrea. And, and on, the, on foreign policy, uh, even members of the Republican foreign policy establishment are deeply concerned about what they see as pandering on China, on Russia, yeah. uh, on other issues. Yeah. And you know, he talks about getting President Obama to be tougher on Iran, it's hard to imagine how you could be really tougher on Iran. Than or that he would have done the exact Obama. opposite on Israel. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, there's been a big debate in elite, in, in elite circles about whether it's kosher to go after Bain Capital. Obviously, capitalism involves creative destruction. But I am truly, really deeply concerned about Romney's record as a businessman and about the kind of capitalism he represents. I think that over the last 30 years, American capitalism has fundamentally gone off the rails, away from making products and toward making deals. And one of the essential qualities 
of a successful private equity capitalist is to emphasize short-term gain and stockholder um, value. And the essential quality in a president in planning the future is to not think about short-term gain, to think about the long-term issues. Um, and I, I haven't heard any evidence at all that, bouncing his chair. Yeah. That, that, Romney, that, Romney is, that, that me, Romney is willing to do that. Let me that. bring in Senator Mitchell and then we'll get back to David. Uh, just two comments on what Joe said earlier about uh, the differences between Obama and Clinton. It, it, it's true that while o Obama uh, has Clinton's intelligence, he does not have his talent for schmoozing. I would argue that very few people have Clinton's talent for schmoozing, <laughs> including very few presidents. Also, Joe, it, it, it takes an overwhelming ambition for someone to run for president and to go through what it requires. But ambition and being an extrovert are not the same thing. There are many presidents, all presidents have had an overwhelming ambition, but there are many who have not been extroverts and who, who have shied away from the hurly-burly and rough and tumble of politics, have, have had others to do it for them. And so, but, if you, but, you, but, but you have to appreciate the elegance of saying, if I give Congressman X the Museum of Volleyball in his b district, he's going to vote for my health care plan. And I don't think that this president, in my dealings with him, thinks on that level. But, uh, but, well, but in, in terms of the dealings I, with Congress. I, I, I right. said, I, 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 I said at the beginning, he doesn't have Clinton schmoozing talent, but that's That's a very not schmoozing high talent, that's deal making. Uh, well, deal making also. Uh, and and, and I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm not making mm. a point that you have to have driving ambition, but you don't have to be an extrovert to succeed in politics or to be president. You know, on the other hand, yeah. on the other hand, whatever the deficiencies of deal making instinct, Unlike Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, and Bill Clinton, he did pass a universal health care bill through Congress at great political right. costs, which no one else had ever done. And they did so in, in a very distinctive way that I want to come back to, David, and maybe ask you. Because I mean, that, one of the characteristics of this was their view that they, they gave enormous deference when they had the majority to the Democratic leaders in terms of both timing and substance on the key issues. And it did allow him, in those first two years, to get an awful lot passed, although the, part of the price was in this more, much more transparent era, many of those bills lost public favor as they went through that, that process. As a style of leadership, that kind of reserve, the domestic equivalent of what they've described as leading from behind. That, that was a reason, but it was not the principal reason. <clears throat> the principal reason was he was told by everyone who'd been involved in the prior effort on health care right. that one of the biggest mistakes we made, and I introduced the Clinton health care bill and was Senate Majority Leader at the time, was to send up a 1,300-page bill to the Congress, which the Democratic chairman and many others felt was too much. You should have sent up a statement of general principles and let us do the details. And so, as often happens, fighting the last war, yes. He sent up a statement of principles because that's what everybody told him had to be done, and he got criticized for that. But so the a answer is, in dealing with Congress, you're damned sometimes mm -hmm. if you do, and damned mm -hmm. if you don't. But David, let me, let me, let me ask you, because I, the point you made about Romney seems to me a larger point about the presidency now. Uh, we were talking about this in terms of Congress yesterday, and whether the freedom of the individual to set their own course is being diminished by the way politics works now. It has become much more of a team sport where there's much less, you know, the, the highest level of party line voting in Congress mm -hmm. since the 19th century, much less freelancing on either side, individual members going out and building coalitions. And I'm wondering to what, set, to what degree even a president today, whether Obama's first two years suggest, and what you're, just, what you're suggesting about Romney, that even a president today is just part of a team, and, does, and on domestic policy at least, doesn't really have an entirely free hand to kind of direct their party. They have a lot of other forces that are now demanding a say. Uh, I, I don't agree with well, that. I, yeah, yeah, I don't I mean, agree with that either. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't either. The, uh, <laughs> Andrew, it's awkward. You're making it. Andrew. Yeah, right, right. Uh, let me just say this. It's a rebellion. I, 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 I remember very, very well in the late 70s when the American public was frustrated by the lack of leadership in Carter, but they'd seen a succession of presidents who had not worked. 
you know, Nixon mm. resigned in, dis in disgrace, and there was just, you know, Ford didn't make it. There were just a whole series of presidents who had not worked out. Let's not and, forget Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> and uh, starting with Lyndon Johnson, and uh, and and there was a there was a in, in many elite circles in places like Aspen, you know, for example, Lloyd Cutler was promoting the idea mm. of having a constitutional convention because no one can govern anymore. No president can govern. It's impossible. Let's have a constitutional convention and create a quasi-parliamentary system. And then along came the most improbable of figures from the West Coast, this a cl a Class B movie actor who nobody thought, you know, and, and people in Washington called him the, the dunce. And it turned out that like FDR, who was also regarded as being light in his loafers, that when they actually took office, they turned out to be strong presidents who spoke out, who brought the country with them, and were able to shape the political environment around them. And both Reagan and I think FDR show it's, we, 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 sh we shouldn't give, you know, don't, don't, let's not assume that nobody can govern anymore. What we need are some fresh leaders. The question yeah. wasn't, the question wasn't whether anyone could govern. The question I was asking was, uh, to are presidents now more in, uh, constrained or inhibited by all the forces that exist within a party and the fact that they are almost always dealing now in this highly polarized era with yep. virtual but, party sure, lines in Congress. But and if you have relationships, I mean, yeah. what my argument would be that successful presidents develop relationships with leaders in both parties and do it repeatedly and yeah. have ongoing conversations. And that's, I think, yeah. partly the success of Ronald Reagan was not just the personal touch with a few key people, but it was the legislative strategy group led by Jim Baker mm -hmm. in the first term that met twice a day, morning and night, and David, you were part of those meetings, mm -hmm. and said, what are our goals for today with the Hill, and by the end of the day, what have we done? And it was picking up the phone, talking to Howard Baker, working mm -hmm. both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, and just with well, Kenny Duberstein and the others, yeah, but to go back to, to Senator Mitchell's point, um, Reagan wasn't dealing with the Democratic yeah. equivalent of the Tea Party. Right. I mean, you know, you can't negotiate. True enough. We, when Mitch McConnell build... comes in and the first thing he says is that my primary goal at a moment of economic crisis for this country is to remove, is to, is to make sure that Barack Obama isn't reelected, what do but you got? Joe, for 18 months, they did not have a single one-on-one -on -one meeting. Now, Mitch McConnell might say that, but that doesn't mean you don't invite him over to the House. Yeah, I agree with that. But, but, yeah. Let's bring him up, Mike, go ahead. Okay, I, I wanted to tell a little story, and that is it's 1964, and the GOP is about to nominate Barry Goldwater at their convention, and George Romney is there with his son, Mitt. And uh, George is very upset that the party's not embracing and Goldwater's not embracing civil rights legislation. <coughs> So he eventually decides to walk out of the convention, and Mitt is witnessing this. And uh, Goldwater is upset and writes a letter to George Romney saying, he was upset, why didn't you endorse me? And George Romney then wrote a very revealing letter that I think is very relevant, so I just wanted to read you uh, one sentence, excuse me, one sentence from it, um, as follows. Uh, Dogmatic ideological parties tend to, excuse me, I need some more light, tend to splinter the political and social fabric of a nation, lead to governmental crises and deadlocks, and stymie the compromises so often necessary to preserve freedom and achieve progress. So that sounds very familiar. Right. Why can't he run and, for president? And, and, <laughs> right? So that is, that's 1964. Mitt is growing up. He's, a, I think, as a teenager, early 20s at mm -hmm. this time, and he's absorbing that. He's learning from his father. You can just imagine the father-son conversation. Mm -hmm. Dad, why'd you walk out of the convention? And George explaining to his son what he was concerned about with the party going too far to the rest, not wanting to compromise. Um, and as governor of Massachusetts, you could see Mitt Romney following um, in George Romney's pattern as George Romney governed as governor of Michigan. Uh, Mitt Romney was, described himself as sort of liberal to moderate, he called himself a moderate and a progressive, did universal health care for Massachusetts and so forth. And in this campaign, he's called himself severely conservative. So I think one of the big questions is, you know, when which people ask me this question all the time, so I'll just throw it out to everybody else, you know, which Mitt Romney will he be if he is president? Is he going to be, you know, the liberal who ran against Ted Kennedy and to the left of Ted Kennedy on gay rights and for abortion rights and against the contract with America? Is he going to be the uh, Mitt Romney who ran for governor and said, I'm going to be a progressive and put through health care and work with a very democratic 
uh, legislature, or is he going to be, as someone mentioned, is he going to have the, the voice of the Tea Party in his ear or the, uh, the far right Republican Party? Or will he hear that voice of his father back in 1964? So let me, yeah. let me ask Senator Mitchell, because yeah. you, you know, when you started talking, you know, making the point that flexibility and intelligence and reasonableness switch from being virtues to, pro to demerits or, or difficulties when you're dealing with uh, counterparties that don't share the same views so, or the same attributes. So in today's highly polarized environment with this, un with this level of party line voting in Congress that we haven't seen since, re since Reconstruction, is that changing the job of the president? Is it different than what Andrea was describing when you had the legislative strategy group that was able to reach out that had a large number of moderate Republicans still in the Senate and a large, you had to deal with a large number of conservative Democrats. Now that we have this level of kind of partisan rigidity, yes. is it changing the job of the president? Yes, it is, but <clears throat> I believe it produces a need opposite from the one you described, that it is a greater emphasis on presidential leadership, a greater demand for a president to lead, make certain that his party is organized and united behind him. No easy task, mm -hmm. especially for the Democratic Party historically, now increasingly for the Republicans. But I emphasize, and I agree with you, Andrew, it, there should be these personal relationships. I have such personal relationships. But you have to have a responsive opposition. We were able to pass the Clean Air Bill for two reasons. One, I had a very good relationship with Senator Dole. The first person I went to see after I was elected Senate Majority Leader as a Democrat was Bob Dole. And I said to him, these are impossible jobs if we don't have trust, difficult if we do. We shook hands on a proposal I made, simple agreement. I'll never try to embarrass you. I'll let you know in advance of everything I'm going to do so you can organize your response. Uh, let's just shake hands that we'll conduct this in a civil manner. We did. To this moment, there has never been a harsh word between Bob Dole and I. We disagreed him yeah. because he was a responsible, reasonable person, as was mm -hmm. President Bush. Mm -hmm. The first President Bush deserves more credit than he gets for the Clean Air Act because when Reagan was in, he was against it completely. He wanted to abolish the Clean Air Act, not, not improve it. Bush took office. Early, he said, I'm for a clean air uh, bill. That meant that the issue changed from will there be a bill to what will be in the bill. And we negotiated agreement. And we did compromise, both sides. We accepted the Republican proposal of cap and trade, although most Democrats did not agree with it, because we felt if we expect them to compromise, we have to be prepared to do so. Now that doesn't exist. And you can't. Look, one and of the so as president, how does that reality change it, your it, it means you have to be, be a stronger leader to the country mm -hmm. and unite the people who agree with you to overcome that. Yeah. The, 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 I went through two debt ceiling uh, mm -hmm. increases as Senate Majority Leader, and it's very tough. The president, I was shocked when I saw President Obama get on television two weeks before the deadline and make a reasonable, thoughtful speech suggesting how he was going to compromise. Sure. There was nothing right. on the other right. side. They were just waiting right. for they, the they, they, He had made the deal with, yeah. with Boehner. And, and, and Boehner right. could not made a deal. I just want to go back to sort of Presidency 101 and, and sort of how, in my judgment, the office best works. And it, it, a lot of this derives from Dick Neustadt's book on presidential power, which sort of a classic back in the... Uh, and John Kennedy, it really was a guide for John Kennedy. And essentially what Andrea's been talking about, what George's been talking about is absolutely right. That you have to play the inside game extremely well. You do have to make the players, you have to build the relationships, you have to build the trust in order to make the inside game of Washington work. But to be an effective president, you also have to have an effective outside game. You have to be able to bring and go to the country and bring the, the people with you so that you've got the support, and when, and when you've got a rec Congress is recalcitrant, uh, if you can't make them feel, see the light, you can make them feel the heat. And it's pretty fundamental. One of the reasons that Reagan could govern and get Democrats to vote for him is that a lot of those Democrats knew that back in their home districts, he was stronger than they were. And if they crossed paths with him on this or crossed swords with him on something, that they were going to pay a political price for that. 
when you look at President Obama, I do think, Ron, he deserves enormous credit for doing with something that no other seven presidents failed at. I was with two of them who failed at that. Uh, and, and getting the bill passed was an enormous credit. I think it was a tragedy that it was a partisan bill and not a bipartisan mm -hmm. bill. And I do think, yes, he had a Republican group that was just, you know, I think went beyond the bounds in a lot of ways, not being willing to negotiate. But it's also true, he, in winning the bill, he lost the country. I mean, this And there's this a reason for that. Well, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Look, ever since this, this era, in my mind, began in 1960, when two candidates stood up in, 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 a, in the first televised debate, and one of them hadn't shaved, and he sweated. And, he, and, uh, and the other one looked really kind of cool. People who listened to this debate on the radio uh, thought the, that Richard Nixon had won it. Um, people who watched it on TV obviously thought John Kennedy had won it, and he won the presidency as a result. After that, Richard Nixon did, came to the conclusion, he was a really smart guy. And so he hired this young TV producer from Cleveland to teach him how to be good on TV. The guy's name was Roger Ailes. And from that day to this, we have seen the, 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 the next thing, after learning how to be good on TV, these advisors began to tell him, hey, you can, you can actually deliver your own message on TV through ads. And, uh, and that could be very effective. And so they had to start raising money to get these ads on TV. And that helped polarize things. And then they had to hire marketing advisors and focus group leaders and pollsters. And I got to tell you that in the history of the last 40 years, these guys, most, more often than not, tell presidents and presidential candidates what they can't do rather than what they can do. You can't do this because this other group will, um, will be upset. And that's exactly what happened with the, the Obama health care bill. Instead of going to the public and saying, look, if you don't make any money at all, if you're totally dependent, if you're a drug addict, you can get free health care from this country via Medicaid. What I want to do is give health care to the 30 million working Americans who go to work every day, can't get health care on their jobs, and really deserve to be rewarded for living a life that is, that, that, that is a, a responsible and honorable life. But he did not do that for one reason. It didn't poll well. But Joe, it, Joe, hold, the, on, you Joe, know, the, Joe hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, uh, other than, you know, that Barack Obama did not make the sale the right way, the reality is that every president has tried to do this, every, every president sought to do it, faced the same kind of erosion of support. That if you, you, can, you can overlay the Gallup numbers for Truman, Clinton, and Obama. They're almost Because identical. they always try to finesse it. They never tell the actual truth. Well, you know, I mean, there, there is definitely a school of thought, you know, in the media that if presidents you know, told the truth to the public, the public would all kind of line up. The reality is, I mean, we are facing the reality of a deeply polarized electorate and a deeply polarized Congress. I want to ask you, David, let me bring you back in. You Can know, I just say, Ron, before yeah, you go yeah. there, there are 30 no, million Americans, many of whom I've interviewed, yeah. some of whom I've interviewed, who are against Obamacare yeah. because they don't know they're going to get health care well, for free. I, absolutely, absolutely. But part of the reason why, and I guess it goes, to the question, it goes back to the question I asked Senator Mitchell, uh, in this highly polarized era, one of the reasons why health care had so much trouble was they, as you suggest, they were never able to get any Republican support. I mean, they, they stopped the whole bill. He gave three months to Max Baucus to try to negotiate with three Republicans on his committee, had enormous criticism in his own party, seemed to be making progress, and then Chuck Grassley in August got a threat of a primary challenge if he made a deal. Um, and Chuck Grassley, who was one of the 23 Republicans who co-sponsored the Chafee Dole bill in 93 right. with an individual <clears throat> mandate, decided that the individual mandate was, quote, a threat to personal liberty. That is emblematic of what we have. We've had four sitting senators denied renomination in the last two cycles, as many as in the previous 26 years, and all of them around the theme that they compromise too much with the other side. So in a world like that, it, what can a president do at this point to try to get significant buy-in from the other party that would, in, would also give a, kind of a broader umbrella for their policies that might broaden their support in the for, public as well. First, first, recognize 
that passage of the bill is the beginning of the fight, not the end. Mm -hmm. right. That's the first point. When, when you negotiate a peace agreement, you know that's very difficult to get an agreement, but it's the beginning of the process. Getting people to implement it is the hard job. And one of the problems here is that the effort halted when the bill was passed and the effort should have begun. Look, you mentioned Roosevelt. Roosevelt was a good schmoozer, but he didn't prevail because he schmoozed with mm -hmm. congressmen. Mm -hmm. He prevailed because he had the American people on his exactly. side. Because he had fireside right. chats, because he was, he was, he had a magnetic personality and was able to convey that to the people. He was very fortunate in who his opponents were. That's a big factor in politics. Mm -hmm. That's a huge factor. Uh, but so, so, so has Barack Obama. Got, you got to so make, has Barack you Obama. Conduct yeah. the campaign after you pass the bill, and the campaign yeah. goes to those in your party and the rest of the public outside the dedicated and committed opposition that you can't persuade anyway. That's what was lacking. Uh, I mean, and, and to that point, the communication strategy. Think of who in this White House can go on. Sunday talk shows or can go out and make a great case for this president. Who do we see out there? We just, we, there aren't the figures. We see his campaign strategists. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. who are not? Well, QED, for God's sake. But the, but the but, I mean. So <laughs> there's that, there's that. Now, a couple of other points. Sure. Immigration. Because of Tea Party threats, to make your point, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, the key mm -hmm. players whom he needed in the Senate on immigration reform abandoned him right. in the midterms, before the midterms. So he didn't have partners. That is correct. Simpson Bowles. The Republicans abandoned what was to be a mandatory, not advisory commission. He went ahead and had the commission himself, but in that case, many people would argue, <coughs> that there was a failure of leadership. He could have walked out in the Rose Garden, embraced it, at least in principle, and said, we can work out the details, but there are building blocks here. Instead, yeah. he ran away from it. Well, well bring in the audience here for a second, but go ahead, Mike. I was just gonna say, you know, regarding Mitt Romney, this is a big question because he has said that he supports the no tax pledge and so forth, and he's also talked oh, rather nicely about Simpson Bowles. How do you do both? How do you you know, say you're not going to do any kind of tax increase whatsoever, but also embrace a plan that might be bipartisan. And which, and which way do you think he'll come down as president? If you look at what he did at Bain Capital and what he did as the governor of Massachusetts, he was a market-based person. So at Bain Capital, you know, he looked at the market, and if the business plan wasn't working for some company, he might say, well, let's try something different. And as a politician, you might say when he was running for the Senate, governor, then presidency, he looked at what the electorate, you know, may have wanted at that time. I mentioned earlier about drawing from different ideological pots. Um, so as president, the big question really is what kind of Congress he would face. If he faces a legislature dominated by the, the Republican far right, the Tea Party, um, he might be so beholden to them. I don't know how he would get some of the things done that he might want to. His instincts, if you go by the governorship, um, would be that he's more pragmatic. So if you remember, the, there's a famous scene where he signed the health care legislation yeah. and the person he ran against in 1994, Ted Kennedy, yeah was standing behind him. Along with the Heritage Foundation, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, before we go to the audience, real quick, and not even an answer, anybody on this stage believe that if Mitt Romney is elected president, he will accept a budget deal in 2013 that has a net increase in federal taxes? I think he, I, I but think, I don't want to get, you know, the I thing just, is, but, I don't want to guess about it. Yeah. I don't want to play a guessing okay. game. I think that it's one of the things that we haven't talked about in this panel is the influence of us in the media on this process. And I got to say, we suck. You know, we really do. And, and I think that... Thanks, Joe. And, and I think that we should have a wall to... I am offering this to all of my colleagues. We should have a wall-to-wall -wall campaign this summer and thrust it on both candidates. Put your cards exactly. on the table. We don't but, want to play a guessing game just, this year. Just, but, just to make the point. Well, Mitt he, he Romney has, has not table. done any interviews right. except for the Bob Schieffer interview, which finally he did do, mm. and much to... Uh, and it was so content-laden. And, and in fact, <laughs> and in fact not, but in fact, he has put his cards. That, that he has, Romney, on this point, has put his cards on the table. 
both in the debate where he said he would not take a 10 to 1 spending cut to budget tax increase deal, and he reaffirmed oh, that in an interview but, but, last oh, week. Oh, come on, so Ron. He, he proposed a tax cut, and he won't tell us how he'll pay right. for it. No, I'm just saying, on this specific I mean, point about whether he would accept a net revenue increase, which would be the price of any Democratic participation, presumably, we need he has already the said board. specifically that he would not he do said, that. He said he, he wouldn't accept a 10 to 1, but he might accept a 2 to 1. <laughs> right. there you go. And where right, the hell is he on immigration? Um, let's go to the audience. Uh, any, let's see, we got two mics, and do we have any hands? Let's see. Yeah, we have one right, right over here, yeah, in the middle. I want to come back before we finish just to talk about the younger generation, what's coming, and yeah. when it is, and that. But... Thank you, panel, for a great uh, discussion. My, my question is uh, broader about uh, what makes a good president, and I wanted to understand context matters. Um, how has the world changed? Uh, and, I, and that affects our domestic policy. You know, and, 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 and it's just very different. You know, our demographics have changed. The world's changing around us. American power is changing around us. How does that impact presidency? I know we've, we've touched on it, but I wanted to get that context. And, and your thoughts on that? How, how is the changing demography at home and the change in America's role in the world change the job of the president? The, the, the campaigns always lag the changes. Uh, the, the impact of the demographic changes worldwide are truly dramatic and will have a profound impact on our country's future. It'll be hardly mentioned in this campaign. I could just say a few things. David's heard this a few minutes ago at another event. In 2050, there'll be nine and a half billion people on Earth, two and a half to three billion increase from what it is now. It took 1,800 years to reach the first billion, 13 years to reach the seventh. It's going to be a profound change. 23% of persons in the world today are Muslim. 33% of the higher number will be Muslim. Uh, you, you wouldn't have any idea of that if you'll follow the presidential campaigns from morning, noon, until night. And, and I, I think that those and other, they're going to be con local regional conflicts. Are going to, what we're seeing now is the new norm, not the uh, major land wars of the 20th and 19th and prior centuries. It's going to be regional and local conflicts, and our interests are implicated around the world and profoundly affected by some of the facts I've said. India will have 500 billion more people than China will at that time. Uh, we, yeah. uh, the, yeah. the demands on land, water, uh, the in pressure on the environment will be enormous. You, you can't get anybody even to talk about it now. David raised it at an early mm -hmm. meeting. It will probably have more effect on your children in 2050 than 99% of what's said in this presidential campaign. Yeah, let me just, let me just say one thing. It, it's, it's clear that presidents in the future much, have much bring a much more inclusive approach to politics, as Bill Clinton did, but I, I really think we ought to turn this over to Ron, who is, I think, the best journalist in the country on the changing demographics and how right. our politics are responding to them. Well, I, mean, I think... Your, your what, column yeah, today. Yeah. The, the, on the domestic point. side, I think, you know, there is a, there is the potential for a very ominous divide. Uh, you have an older, uh, an aging baby boom uh, that is moving right and is overwhelmingly, 80% of today's seniors are white. And because there was basically no immigration between 1924 and 1965, that will drop very slowly. Meanwhile, 47% of Americans under 18 today are non-white. And we will be majority non-white under 18, not in 2050, but in about 2021, 2022. So you have this kind of potential of a, of a stark divide in our politics. You know, it is entirely possible that Barack Obama will win re-election this fall and win only about 41% of whites. He's already, in 2008, became the first person in American history to lose whites by double digits and win. No one had ever done that before, and he won big because minorities are now 26% of the vote, and he won 80% of those people. So we could have an election where you have 80% of minorities voting for Obama and roughly 40% of whites, or 41% of whites, and not primarily because of racism, because much of the white electorate has grown deeply skeptical that government will ever do anything that benefits them, as Joe mm. has chronicled most recently on his trip. So, even, know, even while many of those are, 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 are huge beneficiaries <laughs> of, uh, and of government. The Tea Party, I think, when people are saying, one last thought, when, you know, I, I find myself thinking a lot about what, what does it mean to govern a country if Obama wins at 50.2 with 58 or 59 percent of whites voting against him? And I think the ferocity that we saw in the Tea Party 
is something of a reflection of that. Take back our country is a phrase that has a lot of meanings. And in part, I think it does reflect anxieties in certain parts of the white electorate about this propulsive demographic change that Obama there, uniquely but, embodies. There's a, but, there's, but, a huge, there's a huge fear out there. When I talk to Tea Party groups out in the middle of the country, the subtext is this. You know, we could deal with white black stuff. Uh, we mm. understood that. Um, and we know that blacks were inferior. But all of a sudden, we got all these other people coming in. All the, where did these South Asians who are running all the convenience stores come from? And we got all these Mexicans who don't even want to learn English. And my granddaughter just announced she's a lesbian, and my grandson is dating this black girl, and the President of the United States doesn't have the good sense to be either white or black, and his middle name <laughs> yeah. is Hussein. What happened to my country? Yeah. It is you tremendous. Know. It's a very <laughs> legitimate and tremendous fear. There, there's but, a lot of anxiety out there, which deals which stems partly from the economic Most, yeah. collapse that we all experience. And we should not diminish. Right, right. It does sound like a convenient Absolutely excuse, right. but we should not diminish what was going on when this man came into the office. And the other piece of this is, and you hear it when you go out, and Joe, you've touched on it, some of it is race. And let's face it, the White House doesn't want to acknowledge that, certainly. But some of it is race. No, there so, is but it's not the old binary black white race. And by no the way, all problem. the things that they're afraid of are the things I love most about this but country. It's, <laughs> yeah. okay. it's diversity, Senator. it's ethnicity. Right. Yeah, yeah. That and, is and Obama and Obama, I think, crystallizes this just because he embodies them in a unique way. I mean he, he, right. he puts it in the face of everyone that this is a different country. And there are there are many people who are excited about the opportunity that represents and others who are aren't easy about the change. That represents, and in fact, if you look at polling real quick, if you look at the white elect, the white community, they divide almost exactly in half on whether they believe this is a good thing, the change we're living through is a good thing for the country, or is too much change that is kind of undermining our traditional values. And that how does that divide, break down economically? But what's that? Uh, well, it's it's you know the, the it's older and blue collar are the most uneasy, and the, that is a very clear divide. Stan Greenberg said to me the day after the election in two thousand eight. The Democratic coalition is now diverse America and the portions of white America that are comfortable with diverse America, and there is a lot to that. Let me just say, all true, none of it new. Yeah. All through human history. I, I want to give you a quote written by a guy. Faith is lost. Respect for God is gone. Traditional values are in decline. 555 B.C. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek city-states were in transition from dictatorship and oligarchy to what they called democracy, giving the common man a voice in the governance of the city. And those who possessed power and possessed status saw change as a threat to their power and status. And that lament is as old as civilization, and it's occurring now in a modern American form, but the views are as old as history. And just as in the case of Greece in 555, these, this is the last gasp of people who remember things better than they were and want to hold on to things and feel that it's a zero-sum game in a fixed pie. Right. And yeah. if those blacks and those Hispanics get something, it means I get less. The challenge of leadership is for a president, black or white, to make clear that America was built on the opposite premise. It isn't a zero-sum game. Let's expand the pie, and everybody benefits. And I benefit when black children are educated. And you benefit when Hispanic children get to go to school, and everybody is better off. That's the real challenge of leadership. In the country. Um, over here, over here. Uh, you've mentioned a lot of qualities for the president, but you haven't mentioned character. 
And I'm just curious, since in the last election, someone who I had respected uh, lost that respect by choosing Sarah Palin. Mm -hmm. um, who, <laughs> who do you particularly, since you've been studying Mitt Romney, believe he might pick? And how do we know anything about him if you've written this book and still don't know how he's going to govern? Uh, well, it's two questions. Uh, the first question on who he might pick for vice president, and I have a almost 100% a track record of predicting uh, vice presidential candidates. That means I've always been wrong. <laughs> I, I was in Dayton, Ohio, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning and got a phone call and I said, who? Um, I, I was shocked by Sarah Palin, as were most people. Um, and you can go back and look. And sometimes I think that presidential candidates base their picks on how much they can surprise the media and prove them wrong. Um, you can just go back and look at several. Cheney, uh, you know, go on down the list. Um, it always seems to be surprising. So. I don't know, and I don't know that Romney knows. Um, the only test that there should be, clearly, is that that person's prepared to be president. If you, if it's obvious that you're picking the person because you hope to win state X, you know, such as Ohio or whatever, and people think that's the only reason you picked that person, you know, that would be deeply questioned by people, even who are your strongest believers. But Romney has said, you know, it should be, and they always say this, that it should be someone who's prepared to take over the next day. I mean, you know the story of game change and so forth, and you know why they did. Uh, pick Palin, but it, it clearly worked for a moment and then it, and it didn't work in a, in a big way. The question about how you know, Romney would govern, um, you know, predicting someone, you can, you can look at a 59-point plan, and Mitt Romney has a 59-point plan. I don't think that's an excellent predictor of how he might govern. I think, and if I can just rebut my friend Joe for a second, the media does do a good job and is trying to do the best job it can, given that candidates don't always want to talk to us in analyzing what they do, the best predictor, I think, um, is looking at what they've done in their life. So from my perspective, and my newspaper gave me months to work with others on this biography, to give a good sense of what Mitt Romney has done, how he's faced um, crises, how he's dealt with them, um, why he has, and he has, changed his positions on various issues. So my view is that you want to look at a person's whole life and see how they've responded. So to go back to the George H.W. Bush example, there was a moment, I think, where he said something like, during his presidency in the early days, that he hadn't been tested by fire for what he'd been prepared for. And then, lo and behold, there was the first Iraq war. And he essentially felt um, that this was, the, this was one of those moments that he'd been waiting for. And I know from having spent many hours talking to his, um, his aides, he felt sort of the same way on domestic policy, that he was willing to take the bullet on the tax deal, for example, because he felt that was best for the country. Other Republicans disagreed, obviously, and he lost his reelection. So to go back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, is that a failure or is that a success? Bill Clinton, I think, succeeded in part because the groundwork for his presidency was laid by that unpopular budget deal. With but I think that George H.W. Bush is an important precedent here. What we learned from him was that you can't campaign as someone you're not. And that's a real danger that Mitt Romney is facing now. And as for the vice president, I can say one thing without question. He won't pick Sarah Palin. <laughs> uh, let's see, can we do, if you got one more right over there maybe, perhaps? Oh, Jim? Ron. Ron, can we have a couple minutes at the end? If, we if you were to look at uh, what should be the priorities of the next four years of the presidency, and you could go back in history and pick one president to be president for the next four years, who would that be and why? Mm. President best suited to the challenges we face now. Sarah Mitchell? Th throughout American history? Th I guess, throughout yeah. American history. <laughs> all of history? Yeah. You can buy all. You usually do pretty well with Lincoln. <laughs> Take your pick of Lincoln or Washington or Franklin Roosevelt. Uh -huh. That's, I mean, but that, that, I, I, on it, I have to say, with all due respect, I, I don't think it's really relevant to now because the circumstances are so dramatically different when they govern that they're. Their, their qualities and attributes were uh, arose from the circumstances in which they found themselves. I think, it, not, not to be presumptuous, a better question would be who of the last few presidents would be better. Hey, David, can I ask you a follow-up question from what Senator Mitchell just yeah. said? One thing that's very likely is that this election is going to be decided more closely than the last one. Whoever wins, whether it's Romney or Obama, right. it could. I mean, if the economy collapses, perhaps the bottom could fall out for the president. If it soars, he could win big. But if it stays somewhere on the trajectory we're on, we could see a very narrow sure. result, as well as nearly a 50-50 Senate and a House right. where the margin for whichever party is in control is narrower than it is today. How does that change the equation for the next president? It makes it much more difficult to govern. 
uh, look, I think whoever gets elected is going to have a very rough time. I think we're into for three to five years of turbulence, of uncertainty, uh, twists and turns, of subnormal growth, economic growth as we work our way out of this. You know, I, I happen to be a sort of short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. You know, I think the, I think we just have to face up to it. I think mm -hmm. the next president. I think these. I think to go back to Joe Klein's point, the the person who gets elected would be so much better off if they leveled with us during this campaign and told us what they're going to do and what we face and how hard it's going to be, because we got a lot of tough decisions coming up and it's going to be really hard to get there. And if you don't have the country with you, it's going to be impossible to govern. But let's take. So you take one more question. Um, uh, waving right there, I guess. Influence in America right now in the uh, elite corporatism. How should a president react to that? Because that's what's running this place, I think. Uh, particularly post uh, Citizens United and all yeah. the money. I mean, obviously, we have so much money now in politics. If you think back, um, I first got interested in journalism and politics during the Watergate days when, you know, they were arguing over very small sums of money by comparison to today. So um, Mitt Romney. Um, you can argue that he won the primaries in, in great part because three of his former top aides from the 2008 failed campaign got together, created a super PAC called Restore Our Future, which I'm not sure what that means grammatically, but anyway, he, uh, they, they collected Good un point. unlimited. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. <laughs> wasn't, it, wasn't it Yogi Berra who said the future isn't what it used to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife's an English teacher, so I had to throw that in. Um, yeah. but, but the point is, is that they're, you know, with, with Restore Our Future, they were able to, to collect in unlimited donations, partly as a result of Citizens United, but also subsequent um, uh, court rulings. And the ad man uh, who is part of this group is the same one who did the Willie Horton ad. Um, and he developed some very, very effective ads for this Restore Our Future pack. And they did the ads against Newt Gingrich with the baggage rolling, you may remember those ads and so forth. Um, in other words, this pack was able to do the ads that Mitt Romney himself was reluctant to approve in the last campaign, be able to do it with unlimited donations and without Romney having any responsibility for them, even though they're very closely tied to Romney. And Romney actually appeared at a couple of fundraisers for this super PAC, even though it's theoretically independent. So it's a very, very different world than we're in well, even four years ago. Just, well, let me just, and then uh, Andrew. yeah, Joe. Uh, I, I declined. President Clinton's offer to nominate me to the Supreme Court, and I've often been asked, do I regret it? And a couple of times, and most on the day that I read the Citizens United decision. It was a political and moral disaster for the United States, and it will unleash the... I go all over the country and I speak to audiences, and I ask this question, and I'll ask this audience. Is there anybody here who believes that members of Congress are more responsive to their constituents than they are to their contributors, where to the extent that the two are not identical. Anybody here, raise your hand. Could I, could I have, I? let me finish this, Joe. Okay. <laughs> I have asked this I question to audiences all over this country, and not one single hand has been raised. The essential bond of trust between the electorate and the elected has been severed. Now I'm going to read you a couple of other one sentences and ask who believes them. Quote, independent expenditures, including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or to the appearance of corruption. The appearance of influence or access, furthermore, will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. Who believes that? The Those are direct quotes from, from the, the Citizens, Citizens United, United case. I was going to say, this almost feels like a Jeopardy the question. The premise of <laughs> the decision is a fantasy world which does not exist. And it will harm American politics and the American people for a long time to come. There are a lot of donors in this room. If you think that you've been asked a lot now, and if you think that two billion being spent this year is a lot, wait until 2014 when every candidate for office will have a super PAC. Let, and let me just quickly say that the Republican primary process that we saw, it was not just corporate influence. 
It was that an individual yeah. donor yeah. could keep an unlikely, unqualified candidate. It was a gong show at times on that debate <laughs> stage. The fact that that process a was A single so issue donor, by the way. A single issue donor kept people alive competitively without any kind of uh, broad, you know, corporate mantra. Quick joke. And, and basically, that was the, one of the most corrupt campaigns that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that uh, corrupt Cor the process. Corrupt